Good afternoon. Good morning. Welcome to, uh, usually I say welcome to New America, but welcome to uh, uh, virtual New America to uh, our first event that is uh, rescheduled from an in-person event to, uh, not, uh, not the organization's first, but the first that I've been involved in. Um, and uh, we're, we're really pleased uh, to have you all here. I'm Mark Schmidt. I'm the director of the political reform program at New America. And uh, we are here today in our various uh, locations to talk about a really cool and interesting new book called Hashtag Activism uh, that is, um, that is uh, edited by uh, a New America fellow, Sarah Jackson, who is uh, one, of our, one of the people who will be joining us today. Uh, Sarah is a New America fellow, as I said, in 2019 on a book about memory of, about the civil rights movement. Uh, this is this is a book that this is a project that she started before she became a New America Fellow, uh, along with Moya Bailey and Brooke Foucault, uh, on various forms in which activism has been effective, semi-effective, experimental in the in the online world, particularly around. Um, uh, well, we'll we'll talk about, we'll talk about some of the specific examples, but um, this, it's a it's a really fascinating book, and we'll learn we'll learn more about it. Um, and we're joined also by, uh, uh, I should say, in addition to being a New America Fellow, Sarah is an Associate Professor at the Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and we're joined by, also by, um, that's Sarah waving. Um, we're joined also by Dave Karp, who is an Associate Professor in the School of Media and Public Affairs at GW here in DC. And uh, also has a background as a, as an organizer with the Sierra Club. So, I, so Dave occupies a really interesting role kind of at the intersection of activism and scholarship about activism. Uh, and it has seen this in, 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 from some different perspectives. Uh, and, we're, and our third panelist is uh, Aaron Longbottom, who's the senior manager of campaigns and digital strategies at the National Women's Law Center, which is like the Sierra Club, kind of a, 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 an organization that's been around for a while. Uh, I used to do a lot of work with them in the 90s and have a lot of very high regard for, for National Women's Law Center. And it's been interesting to see how an organization like that changes as forms of activism change. So I'm really interested in, uh, in their perspective. Um, before joining the center, she worked at a rape crisis agency that created community outreach programs for, for kids and has served as an on-call advocate for victims at the, at the hospital. She's um, been involved in a lot of the campaigns that that uh, National Women's Law Center has uh, has organized. So we're going to do this uh, as much like a, a an in person event as as we usually do. If any of you have have been to our have been to our events, and we're, and I'm going to ask uh, uh, Sarah to you know talk for a bit about the 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 research findings of the book and some of the narrative that informs the 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 chapters and. The, you know, there's a theoretical framework here, and then there's very powerful uh, stories of people finding their voice and echoing their voice. And the, you know, I was struck by the phrase, there's a phrase in there that something like, uh, uh, hashtag activism is, is repeated resistance. And it's uh, a kind of ongoing um, uh, amplification of a, of a message that's good, that through a lot of different people. So. Uh, really interesting. I think one thing I want to, the last thing I want to say before we, uh, before I turn it over to Sarah is, of course, there should be a hashtag for this discussion. So if you would like to tweet about this conversation or things you've heard here, uh, please use the, the hashtag, hashtag activism. That is hash, hashtag activism, all one, all one phrase. So uh, I think, I think it was Sarah who suggested that it's, you know, Kind of a basic <laughs> idea, but let's uh, let's go with that, and let's uh, you know expand the audience. For, use the same techniques to expand the audience for this discussion as as broadly as possible. So, with that, let me turn it over to Sarah. Then we'll you know have some discussion with the other panelists and their responses, and then we'll open it up to questions uh, from those of you uh, watching online. Thanks, thanks so much, Mark. Yeah, thanks for everyone. I'm I'm really thankful that. Um, everyone was able to make it. I know we're all sort of experiencing the new normal of doing everything virtually, but that feels sort of on brand uh, for this book right now, uh, especially because we've sort of seen in the last week or two that 
uh, the internet is a really important way of connecting people and keeping, you know, we keep talking about social distancing. I've been saying physical distancing because what we're doing right now is social and hashtags are social and social media is social. Uh, so yeah, if you want to live tweet, as Mark mentioned, here's the, uh, the hashtag, hashtag activism. It's same as the title of the book. Trust me, we had a lot of discussions. Should the title be a hashtag and the word activism? Should it be the hashtag and hashtag activism? Is that redundant? And you know, that's a whole other story, the, the level of conversations we had to have about that. Um, but yeah, thank you all for being here. So uh, I'm going to just start out by offering a few minutes of um, information about sort of what inspired this book. Uh, my co-authors, Moya Bailey and Brooke Foucault-Wells and I um, started writing this book. Uh, really, we started collecting data for it about five years ago. We finished it, um, you know, just this past year. Uh, we have a whole lot of cases. And one of the things that's uh, nice about the number of cases we have is we're able to trace um, ways in which hashtag activism on issues of racial justice and feminist issues and gender justice and trans issues uh, shift over time as um, the technological infrastructures of Twitter itself shifts and sort of as the way that uh, media and political elites um, and sort of mainstream organizations that are advocacy organizations, like for example, the one Aaron works at, have sort of changed their relationships to thinking about uh, hashtags and using hashtags um, in campaigns. So um, just a little background on why we started working on this project. Uh, five years ago, five, six years ago, actually, 2014, um, I watched something happen that those of you who are New Yorkers are probably very familiar with, which was that the New York City Police Department started a hashtag. It was hashtag MyNYPD. And they sent out a very lovely tweet that said, hey, if you have stories uh, that you'd like to share, use the hashtag MyNYPD and we'll share them on our Facebook, you know, send us a picture. And they even gave you a sample of the type of picture they were wanting. It was a picture of, you know, a tourist and I love NY, you know, baseball hat with two um, NYPD officers in Times Square sort of smiling for the camera, right? And they were really doing this as a sort of a PR exercise. And, you know, in retrospect in 2020, we can look back on that and kind of snicker because we can imagine, and I think a lot of people know what happened, which was that immediately the hashtag MyNYPD was overtaken and dominated by ordinary people responding with images and stories of police brutality. And not just New Yorkers, but um, people all over the United States and eventually people all over the world then used the hashtag MyNYPD to talk about issues of state violence and police oppression, um, both in terms of um, racialized violence, in terms of reactions to protest and um, 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 uh, violence against protesters and all kinds of things. And I thought this was really interesting to watch because what started as an elite narrative, and, and for those of you who are in sort of the study of media or communication know, there's a lot of background and research where we talk about how institutions tend to have more power to tell the story. The elite media or the elite institutions like the police and politicians tend to have more power to tell the story. But in this case where the hashtag couldn't be controlled uh, by the elite institution that started it, the story that trended and became popular was really the story about police brutality. Um, and eventually uh, mainstream news channels like MSNBC and CNN and Fox picked up the story of the MyNYPD hashtag being hijacked um, by ordinary people on Twitter. So that was one of the things that really um, inspired us to start collecting data for this book. Uh, and we collected data from basically that period onward. If you have a copy of the book, you know, we go even as far back and look at the hashtag Oscar Grant, which was in 2009 in the very early days of Twitter before its technological infrastructure was what it is today. And we sort of move forward looking through various Black Lives Matter hashtags, um, hashtags related and pre preceding the Me Too movement, hashtags related to trans rights, et cetera. And so just to share, I think for me, what are some of the most interesting findings and and it's fun to co-author a book because you know my co-author is Moya Bailey she's a digital humanist my co-author Brooke Foucault Wells she's a network scientist and we each kind of have our favorite findings kind of dependent on our our own backgrounds but for me I think there's 
three big takeaways from the book. Um, one is that we really see through hashtag activism the power of ordinary people to change public narrative. Um, and so again, in this sort of story where um, many people have argued throughout history that it has been elites and people with sort of various sets of privileged access who have the power to change narrative. We see through, you know, we call short hashtag, we call hashtags digital shorthand, right? And they become these compelling, short, um, easy to pick up, easy to share narratives in and of themselves that really then can have an influence and we see do have an influence on um, mainstream conversations and mainstream debates. Um, two, the other thing is, the organic way in which the networks are built. Um, that was one of the things that I thought was more interesting that we found is that oftentimes hashtags started with people who uh, didn't necessarily have huge followings, weren't necessarily in positions of power, were again sort of ordinary folks who started a hashtag and that particular hashtag, that particular narrative that they offered became compelling enough that they were able to connect you know, across different networks and groups of people on Twitter attract allies, sort of tell new stories, um, garner attention from mainstream media. And so again, that was really an interesting um, um, thing that we saw where ordinary people had a new set of power. Um, now, of course, we can talk about there are obviously limitations to this and the book itself has a selection bias and that we write about hashtags that were essentially successful. Right. So we're really examining what about successful hashtags made them successful. Certainly people start hashtags all the time that don't trend and don't influence uh, mainstream uh, political debates. And so that's something maybe we can come back to later if, if people are curious about that. Uh, but for now, I will um, sort of just wrap up. Uh, hopefully that's enough of a summary for folks who are sort of new to the topic. Um, and I'm excited to hear from my fellow panelists and sort of dig in here. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. That was really uh, that was really fascinating. Why don't um, uh, I don't think we really uh, discussed an order here, but why don't why don't I turn it over to Dave uh, to start, if that's all right uh, with uh, with you? And and I think it, it is really interesting as you read a lot of these stories. A lot of these people, a lot of the people who've started these campaigns, really were pure grassroots activists. I mean, they're in that in the forward section, for example, there's repeated there's repeatedly uh, mentions of I couldn't really follow all this because I, I had a job and I had to be at my job and I wasn't my job and the person's job obviously had nothing to do with uh, with this. Um, but I think as we turn it over, we're going to talk about people whose jobs do involve this right and and who's and and how this relates to organizations where where they're trying to do it. So in a way, we're kind of looking at one particular dimension of the whole universe that you're that you're talking about, although Obviously, both of you can, all three of you can talk about uh, all aspects of that. So with that, I, I, let me just uh, hand it over to Dave. Great. Um, first, let me note, I've read the book. I love the book. Everyone should buy the book. Great book. Um, I want to pick up on the last thing that Sarah just said to identify what I think is kind of a boundary condition here. Um, Sarah noted at the end there that the, this hashtag activism can be tremendously powerful for ordinary people in changing public narrative. I think that's exactly right. Um, public narrative is powerful, but it's only one manifestation of power. And I think particularly when I look across organized political advocacy and activism, one of the things that calls to mind is, uh, like when I'm teaching strategic political campaigning, the first thing I always tell students is, uh, or, or people that I'm training, um, it depends on what what your goal is, who your target is, what you're trying to get your target to do. Um, and sometimes what you're trying to do in a political campaign or an advocacy campaign is change the public narrative. And that's where I think uh, hashtag activism and similar forms of digital activism are at their strongest. Um, sometimes what you're trying to do is uh, like get Mitch McConnell to do a thing that Mitch McConnell doesn't otherwise want to do. Um, and that's where changing narratives end up end up sort of showing their limitations. Um, one of the examples that I often use in class, um, if we take the, the some of the origins of the Black Lives Matter movement, I think there's absolutely no question that without hashtag Ferguson, we don't have uh, the mobilization that happens there. Um, getting re reporters getting their editors to allow them to go to Ferguson, Missouri, to cover 
a white cop shooting an unarmed black guy um, when their editors have never heard of Ferguson, Missouri. And um, sadly, that, that doesn't sound like news. That's uh, an all too common occurrence. That doesn't happen without the hashtag trending. Um, so if to the extent that the goal is changing the public narrative, and that is important, hashtag activism is tremendously important. Um, but we don't just want to change public narratives. We also want pretty racist white juries to actually convict a racist white cop. And that's where the changes in narrative sort of run into the limitations of power. Um, and that's where other elements of this activism, I think, end up needing to be expanded. When, when organizations, when advocacy organizations are trying to figure out what should we be doing on Twitter, they need to always pause and say, well, what are, who are our targets and what are our goals right now? Because if what they're doing is like running a legislative campaign to try to get some senators to work on a piece of legislation, sometimes what they like what is needed is actually get this legislation on the news. So work through hashtags to influence the mainstream media agenda, and that can work. Um, but sometimes like what you're gonna need is like a set of lobbyists making some cunning arguments or like a really strong primary challenger. And then you're gonna need to build organization. And hashtag that activism as Sarah and her co-authors document in the book also can be useful for building, for creating the building blocks of new organizations, of new movements. But that's where the online activity needs to translate into organizational infrastructure, which then reintroduces a bunch of old organizational problems, right? Like in order for Black Lives Matter to become a successful networked movement, not only do they need their hashtags to trend, they also th then need like people's email addresses so that they can like organize them into Slack channels and, and Facebook groups. They need funding. They need to navigate all the stuff that comes with funding and all the leadership problems that then crop up. Um, and they need to like separate the, the wheat from the chaff, figure out like what are the most strategic uses of, of our resources as we go. So as we move from public narrative into uh, other layers of political power, I think that's when we reintroduce a bunch of the old organizational problems that have always been with us. Wow, yeah. thank, you, thank, you, thank you very much. I, I'm tempted to ask some questions right now, but I'm going to resist that temptation and, uh, and, and turn it over to, to Aaron uh, to talk about their experience, you know, from various things that, that they've done and, and uh, from within an organization. Yeah, um, I mean, I think what Dave brought up is something that I grapple with all the time in my job. <laughs> um, how do you a create a hashtag that's going to move people? A, you're also coming from a place of, you know, I think Sarah, in your book, you looked at a lot of storytelling and pe people who just sort of organically came up with these hashtags. Um, I think uh, we got hashtag of survivor privilege that was responding to that George Will column, it was so powerful, but as an organization, that's not where we're coming from. <laughs> we're sort of trying to reverse engineer that moment a lot of times. And sometimes you get really lucky and you have a moment, uh, you know, I think like National Center for Transgender Equality in the last few years had a couple of those moments with Protect Trans Kids um, where they got to respond to something really quickly, but those moments don't happen a lot and as an organization, you really have to be super nimble to take advantage of them. And that's, I mean, like a huge gift falling in your lap if something like that happens. Uh, so I think a challenge is to come at it from, well, I have to, how can I engineer a hashtag in which folks will actually engage, we'll get our messaging out, people will want to use it as a storytelling platform, they'll want to organize under it, and it'll move them to offline action, um, which is a huge task and uh, I think we fail at it more times than we succeed when we come at it from that angle. Um, but it's an interesting, it's an, it's an interesting problem. And yeah, I mean, I think when I'm thinking about doing campaigns and you know, when folks say, can we put a hashtag around this? I always ask people to pause and think really critically about why they're putting a hashtag on it because if we're just hashtagging for the sake of hashtagging it's going into the void and there's no, we're just wasting characters on twitter at that point <laughs> but i think that there are moments in which we can create hashtags that are helpful um you know our organization in the last few years um we 
have this particular issue we work on, which is um, sort of religious refusals in healthcare. So folks who are um, doctors or pharmacists who are basically using their religious beliefs to deny people care. So for instance, pharmacists not giving people birth control because they don't agree with birth control or doctors refusing to refer people to abortion providers or something like that. Um, and this is, you know, a problem we're trying to motivate, organize people around, but how do you distill such a thing into something that's actually understandable? Because if I say the word religious refusals, uh, probably no one knows what that means. <laughs> so for, from our perspective, reverse engineering, you know, we look at messaging, we look at what people respond to, and then, you know, like all good hashtags, it's got to fit in a sentence, it's got to be declarative. Um, so, you know, that's where we sort of landed on our Put Patients First campaign, which is our way of doing storytelling and it's still going strong and folks are still using and engaging in it, even though we started it now, I think two years ago. And, um, you know, one thing organizations can do is have those hashtags that live on for a long time and we can keep returning to them and build and building narratives on top of them. Um, and, you know, it's great. One tool of the hashtag is that you can look at the archive of everything, which is really cool. And so to see how those things change and blossom over time is, is fascinating and a great tool for us. So. Great, I think that, thank you very much. That's really fascinating. I'm curious how, when you say, um, if you, you know, a lot of things are gonna fail, is that all right? I mean, is, it does seem like a, a kind of a field, with, a kind of an approach where maybe you do try a hundred things and, and one or two of them really kind of catch on when, as you say, you're sort of trying to reverse engineer it. I mean, it's kind of like, I remember in sort of the, the old days when people would say, well, let's try to get a viral video. And it's like, well, you, you really have no idea what makes something kind of catch on. So maybe sure do it, but don't do it once, you know? Is, is, a certain, what, is a certain level of failure with this okay? And how does that shape how you go into things um, given that? Yeah, I mean, no one wants to fail, obviously, but um, I think being, well, one good thing about Twitter is there isn't as much of an algorithm issue as with other platforms. So, you know, in Facebook, if you fail at something that might actually have repercussions for you on your page, you know, as an organization for a while, but on Twitter, it's not so much. And so I think you have the freedom to fail um, and you're not gonna expect everything to take off, but that's how you learn. Um, you know, you learn that people don't wanna engage with a, you know, 20 character hashtag because it's too long and it doesn't make sense. Um, but you learn that someone will engage with something that's storytelling like hashtag me too or hashtag you know me, which is Bill's Busy Phillips um, abortion storytelling hashtag. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's expected and it's funny that you bring up the viral thing because yeah, it's a joke amongst all digital people of how do I make this go viral? And we're like, you <laughs> really can't. <laughs> well, you know, if I can um, jump in on that, it's interesting because we actually talk about this a bit in the book, um, even though we're not looking at hashtags that are coming necessarily from formal organizations, we do talk about, you know, the reason that the hashtags that we study trend and others don't when there are many others, it has a lot to do with affect and has a lot to do with authenticity. And so this question, you know, I, I sort of always like hedge it, like, you know, advising, um, because so many times it's actually, you know, advertisers who want to learn how to trend a hashtag or people with other sort of nefarious, you know, intent. <laughs> but a lot of times the reason that hashtags trend organically is because there's something effective about them that people can see their own experience. They can feel some kind of empathy or not just sympathy, but empathy identification with, um, but also that the stories and the hashtags seem authentic. And also sometimes it's as simple as, you know, what Aaron said, that some hashtags are too long or uh, they're not catchy. Um, and um, a great example of one organization that we do look at in the book, we look at the hashtag um, Say Her Name, which is a hashtag that was popularized by the African American Policy Forum, which is, um, you know, an organization that focuses on drawing attention to the way that um, women of color and particularly black women experience um, state violence and how those experiences are different um, because of gender. 
Um, and um, they actually initially had a different hashtag. We talk about it in the book, and of course now I'm, I'm blanking on what the, the first hashtag was, but that hashtag didn't pick up but the hashtag say her name, um, which w was popularized and had already sort of been used in other contexts related to the Sandra Bland case and sort of other cases of police violence against black women, really was popularized and then really became a part of their sort of identity and their campaign. And so they learned very quickly to use that hashtag instead of sort of the initial the initial one because that connected them to networks of activists and ordinary folks who were already like thinking and talking about um, these issues of gender and police violence um, on Twitter. And so sometimes it's a matter of, you know, these organic things happening at once. Is it effectively compelling? It is, does it seem authentic? Are there, you know, networks who are already cued into and paying attention to this? And these things can all, you know, is it short enough? Is it catchy enough? Does it make a clear enough argument? And, you know, a lot of people have said that one of the reasons Me Too became so popular is because it's literally the embodiment in a short hashtag of the concept that the personal is political. The, you know, it makes a claim about a political condition and experience and a need for political change through personal storytelling and we look at a lot of hashtags like that in the books that do something similar so i think you know there are some elements that can be intuited about what works and what doesn't and i just want to layer one more point on that which is it stands out to me as well that you can fail a hashtag can fail for free right and that means that while organizations need to pursue authenticity and there's that, like that's that's a little dicey like let let's all really perform authenticity just perfect um like the night like if you compare social media activism to an activist campaign where what you're doing like I, I was just thinking back to one of the first campaigns that i worked on when i was a high school student and we had a budget of 300 dollars total and we decided to do a mailing and we had to get that mailing right because that was our entire budget and there were like, it was for a training day and we spelled training wrong. And then we just had to sit with that because like you made the one mistake, but that was your <laughs> entire budget. That like, like communication used to have a marginal cost to it. And that meant that like you needed to like have a big plan in advance and you couldn't learn after trying. And for organizations, while there is that challenge of you're probably not authentic because you're probably like sitting in a committee meeting coming up with hashtags and like that's a new difficulty. The nice thing is if you try a bunch of things, so long as you don't end up making massive fools of yourselves, like you can try things out and learn from them and figure out, oh, this hashtag doesn't work. We're gonna use me too, or we're gonna use say your name instead. And like that can work because you didn't just spend your entire budget on the first thing. Dave, that kind of reminds me, this is something I think about a lot in, in relation to a lot of things, right? So like, you know, classic, the classic shift in the 2000s from, direct mail advocacy organizations that had members who would join or not join for year or lifetime to move on, right? Where, you know, it's continual interactions, but there's still campaigns. Uh, and, and I think I, I do, do a lot of work on money and politics too. And it's like, the reason we have this, you know, kind of small donor revolution of people sending, you know, three dollars to Elizabeth Warren or whoever is because the cost of asking for the next contribution is so low. So in an older era, you had to, you know, you sort of had to guess at what people were able to give and try to get there. But when the when the when the uh, transaction cost of each next move is low, you can do a lot in a different way if you get your head around it. Right. The, the, the other thing that calls out there is um, there's a distinction in the old move on or old now. The move on style, which is old because it's like a decade or two old, um, which is focused on email and aggregating email lists, which once you have a list of people who have donated to you once, it's close to free to email them again. Um, and there's a distinction there between that and organizing via hashtags, because the challenge with organizing via hashtags is it can be very difficult to capture that list of people and follow up with them. So the, the virality of hashtags, well, it's a lot easier. Like I think I, when I teach classes on this stuff, I often teach about 
um, uh, Coney 20, uh, 2012. 2012, yeah. Right? Which, like, when I started teaching that, all <laughs> of my students had memories, and then for a while they didn't, and now all my students are like, oh, yeah, I was in elementary school when that happened. So I'm like, uh, uh, <laughs> we're getting old. <laughs> um, but the fascinating thing about that is that trends on Twitter, that gets 100 million views in a few days on YouTube, and a couple years later, with Joseph Coney still out there, the organization shuts down for lack of funding. And to me, the lesson there is, look, 100 million people viewed that content on YouTube. And that means that Google, which owns YouTube, knows who that 100 million people are. But the organization that produced the video and got the hashtag to trend doesn't have that list of people that they can reach out to and say, like, hey, we could really use two bucks. But Dave, don't you think that more has to do with the failures of the organizational model? I mean, the organization that ran 2020, 2012, mm -hmm. 2012 had so many like shady practices. They had misinformation about what was actually happening in Uganda. Like mm -hmm. Joseph Kony wasn't even there at the time. They were giving money to some of the same entities that were also using child soldiers and like also using, you know, rape as a weapon of war. And they were very, and their leadership, I think had some questionable sort of behaviors and things happen. So, I mean, I think that's an interesting example of something goes viral successfully. And, uh, you know, they, the reason it went viral successfully was because of the affect, right? Because everyone watched the video and felt like compelled. But for me, the reason that it doesn't, result in as much sort of concrete um, change or action isn't necessarily because it's hard to track down those people and it's hard to get, keep them engaged in the campaign, but it's because the movement itself was flawed in terms of what the way that it understood political solvency, even what it thought the solution was that it was trying to solve was, you know, sort of sweeping in with this like savior mentality into another country and fixing something without them themselves having the context of this sort of inner workings of what was happening in Uganda and what was happening with, uh, you know, all that stuff. So, I mean, I hear you, but like, I sort of like pushed back a little bit on that being a problem of the, the people who were drawn into it and more so a problem of like how it was um, managed, but. I, I think I 30% agree, 70% disagree. Um, because I think, like, yes, there were a lot of flaws with the organization and with what they were doing. Um, a lot of flawed organizations stick around for a long time, though. Sure. Um, and one of the things that helps them stick around is having a, like, if they had that, if they had a hundred million person list, then that can allow them to endure an awful lot of flaws. Um, the place where I do agree is that I, I often view the, the problem for them is that they didn't have a clear next step once they had gained public attention. So that like their tagline was make Joseph Coney famous and like, congrats, you did that. But that wasn't your actual goal. And if the goal after make Joseph Coney famous is, okay, I guess the US military should invade large swaths of Africa because so we're, act we're not actually sure what country he's in. So just like send a mil the military to do some stuff. Like, how, how are you gonna do that? Like, that's where they didn't have a good answer and that's where their other problems I think became more apparent and also their ED had a, had a mental breakdown. Um, but I think all of that would be recoverable if they had a list because, and again, like organizations all the time like make some mistakes or haven't really thought out what's gonna happen once you have your big moment in the sun and then over time they figure it out. And I think that figuring out if they had had some kind of infrastructure to fall back on to keep uh, like keep momentum there, I, I think they would have been better off. Yeah. Do you think a good example, like I can think of two sort of organizational good examples. One is um, Planned Parenthood, mm -hmm. which um, I want to say in 2012, when the Susan G. Komen Foundation withdrew their funding from Planned Parenthood, they started the hashtag um, stand with PP or I stand with PP. And that was a hashtag that very successfully trended. And again, part of that was because almost every person who has needed to go to a Planned Parenthood in America was like, well, yeah, I stand with PP because I went there when I was in college for birth control or that was where I got my per first pap smear. And it was very much about that sort of like affective um, storytelling. So again, it was different than the Coney 2012 example because it wasn't about 
saving some people over here that we don't know actually about the politics of their country. It was about people's own personal experiences in politics, which I think is a, a important <laughs> distinction in like the cases that we look at in the book as well. Um, but that is a hashtag that also then Planned Parenthood has been able to successfully levy across platforms and in different ways and over time because it's not specifically tied you know they didn't use Komen in the hashtag they didn't use the year in the hashtag it's not tied to a specific moment or a specific person even though it originated in that moment so even now in 2020 as Planned Parenthood continues to be attacked um, by certain people in policy and legislation people are still using the hashtag I stand with PP because it's sort of this more universal uh, sort of discourse. And I think that again goes back to Aaron's point about like, well, how do we know what what is a good hashtag look like? And we can't predict it, but I think those again, that sort of reflects um, some of the qualities. And the other example, if, if I can um, quickly, that I was thinking of is, and back to your very original point, um, Dave, about this larger universe of activism and advocacy, you know, that's something we totally agree with and we talk about in the book that, um, you know, we see hashtag activism um, similar to our activism, similar to other forms of media activism as part of sort of the changing the hearts and minds, um, changing the story, helping people imagine um, a different narrative, right, about the world. But of course, that doesn't change the fact that we need um, people engaging in, you know, traditional forms of petition and policy change, traditional forms of like on the ground, um, you know, sometimes civil disobedience and other forms of action. And um, that was something that I'm sure everyone here knows um, many sort of hashtags were critiqued for like, oh, online activism is slacktivism, it's not legitimate, it's not this and this. Um, but what we know is that, you know, most people who are going to show up for a protest or going to get on a mailing list are going to do that with or without the hashtag, but the hashtag draws a larger audience in. And so I think the Black Lives Matter hashtag is a really, really great example of that where there's an organization, an official organization that, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter founder, founders and other racial justice activists working on issues of police brutality have called the Organization for Black Struggle. They have a website, they have a mailing list that's much more akin with what Dave is talking about with the traditional, you know, they send you an email, they ask for donations, they tell you what their specific campaign demands are. They're also connected to an organization, Color of Change, which similarly has a mailing list and does specific policy demands and campaigns. Um, but they were able to get much more public attention, much more media attention, um, a much more sort of like diverse network of people paying attention to these issues through the hashtag than through um, just the sort of actual one-on-one uh, -on -one engagement. And so I, I agree with what Dave said originally about this being sort of one ingredient in a larger, more successful strategy for, for any organization. I don't know if Aaron would agree with that, but. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think like we're not expecting, you know, when you use a hashtag, you hope that it brings people to you as an organization, but I think for me, my approach with any hashtag that we're making, um, you know, recently we started a narrative change campaign around abortion and that also has a, has a hashtag, but I think, you know, we're hoping people engage with it and it pushes the narrative broader than just folks who are on our email list who are already following us um, because someone retweets that into their feed or someone chooses to engage with the hashtag and someone outside of our network sees it. So it's very much, I think, you know, yes, it can move people to action, but I think from an organizational perspective, it's all about the narrative change and the messaging for me and thinking about how can we create a hashtag that taps into the storytelling, taps into, yeah, like imagining the world that you want, um, which is, you know, goes back to our sort of healthcare hashtag, which is put patients first, you know, that's a values-based positive framing um, and our abortion campaign is abortion act, hashtag abortion actually, because we want people to talk about what abortion actually is versus all these negative things that are out there about it. So, you know, it's, we very much tap into that positive, like imagine the better world and hope that it reaches folks outside our network. But yeah, I mean, you hope that then they join your email list or they take action with you or they show up to your protest. Um, but 
yeah, I mean, it's hard to convert people and move people up that ladder. Um, but I think, yeah, the, the strongest, the strongest thing about hashtags is definitely the storytelling and the messaging and just reaching folks and hopefully amplifying your message to, to more people. And it's free, like you said. <laughs> That's great. I, I had a whole bunch of things that I wanted to ask more about, and I'm gonna I, I, I'm gonna resist that temptation and um, and and kind of get started with some of the questions that are that are coming in from uh, uh you know from people who are watching. And let me let me just start with a, a question that that's that particularly addressed to Sarah, but obviously for for anybody. Which is, can you say a bit more about Black Twitter and the ability of that community to drive conversations? Um, uh, are there other communities out there that are especially good at repeatedly driving online conversations? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks to whoever asked it. <laughs> um, so we'll never know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, so yes, so I'm sure people who have studied Twitter sort of paid attention to the discussion about like why Twitter has become such a um, sort of not just act influencer in terms of politics and activism, but also cultural and pop cultural influencer probably knows that, you know, a lot has been written about the fact that compared to um, our representation in the US population and compared to our representation on other social media platforms, African Americans are overrepresented on Twitter. So Twitter has a larger um, user base of African Americans than, than um, other platforms. Um, and I think there's a lot of things about the technological infrastructure that have made, you know, what people call um, Black Twitter into a thing that, you know, uh, a few years, I think um, the Los Angeles Times hired a reporter just to cover Black Twitter and, you know, some other um, um, journalistic publications have done that as well. And, you know, research reports have come out. And that has to do with the fact that you can follow anybody. So unlike um, on other social media, which is sort of reflective of how racially segregated um, our communities in the United States are, where, for example, on Facebook, you tend to be friends with people you know in real life. And for most Americans, that's people of their same race. On Twitter, you can follow anyone and you see other people's content when it gets retweeted into your timeline by people you follow. And so as a result, it's much easier for users who aren't black to follow black users on Twitter and to sort of see what those stories and narratives are that are happening. And in fact, we talk about in the book how this hit was really useful for allyship around some of the um, Black Lives Matter stuff. Um, and so, yes, so, so black users on Twitter have been extremely influential, not just in terms of politics, but in terms of popular culture, in terms of style. Uh, we talk about in the book, and there's a great example in our foreword that Mark mentioned from um, Jeannie Lauren, who is um, sort of a become an influencer, I would say, on Twitter, where, you know, ordinary folks who have a certain, um, what I would call, um, uh, really rooted in Black cultural communication style, sometimes sarcastic, sometimes like sort of dark humor, um, sometimes uh, uh, able to able to talk about very serious topics in a way that is accessible. So talk about, for example, race and racism in a way that you can also laugh, which sounds you know, very odd. A lot of those communication styles you see in, in the successful hashtags and in the successful and popular tweets, and a lot of those come out of Black Twitter. And so, you know, I think it's interesting and, and absolutely the case that um, networks of African American folks on Twitter have really had an important um, and significant influence in, in politics. And you see that as well in feminist Twitter, where very early on in Twitter, there was sort of the immediate, um, headbutting and engagement of critiques coming from women of color and women of color feminists about uh, the claims and sort of demands of what they were seeing as white feminism only representing, you know, certain types of experiences. And I don't think it's an accident then that when we look at um, successful feminist hashtags on Twitter that have trended and become popular, a large majority of them actually were started by women of color. Um, so, Yes All Women was started um, by um, a Muslim American woman. 
um, you know, um, survivor privilege was started by a black woman, why I stayed was started by a black woman, um, you Okasis was started by a black woman, um, say her name was started by a black woman, um, and me too, although it was popularized by Alyssa Milano, as we know, was originally, you know, used by Tarana Burke in her, in her activist campaigns. And so I think that that is partially a response to the fact that on Twitter, um, there's more direct, um, sort of, not just engagement, but also critique across racial groups so that there's more, and you know, some people might call it call out culture and I really don't like to use that term, but there's more people saying like, hey, this group, did you know there's this whole other group of us over here having this other set of experiences that you haven't been advocating around, that you haven't been tweeting about? And that has really become sort of a part of the part per course of Twitter political engagement. And I think that's why we see Black Twitter being so influential. Um, before before going back to, I, I, I feel like Aaron wants to say something, but before doing that, I have the most mundane question. I, I, I'm somebody who lives, who's pretty active on Twitter, completely off Facebook for decades, or as long as one could be off it. Um, are we talking about something that's almost entirely Twitter? I mean, I, it seems to me there are Facebook and analogs to some of the campaigns. Are there, is there, are there any that start there or are, are we talking almost exclusively about a Twitter form? Well, it's interesting because the hashtag Black Lives Matter, um, Alicia Garza, who's one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, first used that hashtag on Facebook. Um, but the technological infrastructures of Facebook and the way things trend are different. So it, you, you know, hashtags don't really trend on Facebook, like the, the, in, the they do, but it's not the same. It's not like then everybody on Facebook sees it. It's still within, you know, your network or whatever. Um, so a lot of, there was a lot of crossover. Um, similarly, YouTube very early on when Twitter was still, in the early days of Twitter, you couldn't embed videos, you couldn't embed, embed pictures. We know now you can do that. But so early on, you know, um, for example, in the Oscar Grant case, it was the YouTube video of Oscar Grant being shot by Bart Police that went viral. And people were sharing it on Twitter, but it had to be an outlink. So people would have to follow the link out to YouTube in order to see the viral video. Whereas now, um, if that happened today, and I want to say, you know, God forbid, but it probably will happen again, you know, um, if someone shares that video on Twitter, it will actually autoplay, which, you know, there's a whole critique about that and whether that's good for people's mental health, but you'll be able to watch it on the platform. So yes, there's other um, social media networks like Facebook, YouTube, um, Instagram also comes into play here. Um, but the, the way that the, the sort of architecture of Twitter is makes it, I think, uniquely easy for things to spread across groups of people that don't know each other in real life. Interesting. Aaron, did you want to, did you have thoughts about the I think I was just uh, nodding my head really enthusiastically about Sarah's call out culture uh, comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I also agree the platforms are just structured completely differently and folks don't engage in hashtags on other platforms in the right. same ways. Okay. Um, um, thanks for helping about. me with, thanks yeah. for helping with me with the mid, that kind of mundane question. Um, <laughs> question here. Uh, in the uh, note from the authors in the book, it, it says that Jeannie Lauren, who wrote the foreword, was a victim of brigading uh, in, that caused her account to be suspended. Uh, and I, I think it's, I, I don't think the reason was ever clear. The question is, how common is this? And, uh, and how much have the hashtag movements uh, faced that kind of opposition or, or been shut down? Uh, Dave and I are actually part of a sort of, I don't know, what would you call it, Dave, like a think tank where <laughs> we're studying um, online sort of harassment and silencing and sort of some of the not good things, which there are many, right, as we know now, um, about uh, social media. And so, yes, one of the things is that um, some of the tools, some of the algorithms, some of the methods that platforms like uh, Facebook and Twitter have put into effect in order to supposedly protect people um, from harassment, hate speech, etc., can also then be appropriated um, by those wanting to spread hate and used against them. And so that's was what happened to Jeannie Lauren, who was wrote the foreword of our book um, and had a really was a really pivotal person in a couple of the hashtag networks. 
where she tweets often about race and racism and racial justice issues. And um, she had her account brigaded, which means a group of people organized and all reported her for abuse at the same time. And the way that Twitter had set up the algorithm was if you get reported for abuse, multiple times, they would just automatically suspend your account. And so this became a silencing tool for, you know, white supremacists and men's rights activists and other people who wanted to silence racial justice activists or feminists, they could all go and um, report the account and the algorithm would suspend before checking, right? So it was like they would suspend you and then, then only later, if you sort of wrote to them and you know made a big deal about it, could you get unsuspended? And that's what happened with Jeannie. Jeannie actually had to um, go through the, um, um, I'm blanking on the name, but it's a, it's a legal advocacy organization actually she, that worked with her to reach out to Twitter to get her unsuspended. And she came to the release of the book in, in New York just a couple weeks ago when we were still going out in public. Um, and she talked about how, you know, eventually they unsuspended her and they even invited her to Twitter headquarters and, you know, have been very um, generous with her, but not everybody has the benefit of, um, being able to have somebody advocate for them in, in, in a moment like that. And so it's not uncommon. And of course, just like the real world, um, the people who are targeted with sort of brigading and other forms of online harassment um, tend to be people who are already have marginal identities in, in society. So obviously um, in, for example, the hashtags on feminist issues, you often see um, women getting rape threats on Twitter um, or other sort of serious forms of identity-based, you know, harassment. Um, you often see um, Black folks being called racial slurs on Twitter. And, you know, I mean, we've even seen this with people who are in positions of power. We've seen this in the last few years with some of our new Democratic Congresswomen um, who have been being inundated <laughs> with rape threats and uh, racial slurs and, you know, all these things. And there's a lot of questions about how they as public figures even are supposed to respond to that, whether they're allowed to block people, whether they're not because they're politicians. So um, it's a problem. It, it is one of the problems that the platforms, Twitter and all other social media platforms need to do better um, on figuring it out how to handle. Anything either of you want to add? Uh, on that experience? No, I, I think Sarah basically got it. The, the only thing I would add is that it has been becoming more common because things like brigading are a tactic and you have networks of people who have figured out this is a way that we can deploy power against those who are voicing opinions that we disagree with. As Sarah said, they are mostly deploying that power against people who also come from marginalized identities. Um, some of the viewers will, will uh, know I got into a bit of a tiff with Brett Stevens, a New York Times columnist back in August. I got zero death threats. And wow. Like, yeah, I know, We're like what is a good, what is a guy <laughs> gotta do to get a death threat? Um, but I, if, that, if I, that had happened to any of my female colleagues in my department, they would have gotten dozens of death threats as they do basically every week on Twitter. Um, so that definitely fits, that, that, that definitely it's amplified by marginalized identities, um, but it, it's tat it, it is a, a strategy that is being pursued. I think the, the other reason why I didn't get any death threats is that Brett Stevens being a never Trumper meant that the people who would deploy that tactic, uh, if it had been me versus like Tucker Carlson, were like, eh, we're going to sit back and laugh because we don't like that guy either. So I got lucky in who my opponent was. Um, but that, that is evidence that like this is strategic yeah. behavior. Yeah. which only is going to get better if the platforms decide that they're going to step up and, and actually do something about it, which they've been yeah. really slow to do. And that's something that's really important that, you know, we get asked when we talk about the book a lot, my co-authors and I, is about, you know, we always get this question that's like, well, what about the Nazis on Twitter, right? Or like, what about the Russian bots on Twitter, right? And, and, and our position on that is like, yeah, 
what do, like we wrote a book about these particular networks and these particular hashtags because we really feel that this is an important and undertold story to sort of highlight how marginalized groups are using hashtags in ways that you know Twitter wasn't made for them you know it wasn't made for this but it's this really innovative strategy and of course you know there are other scholars and other people who are doing the very important work of studying how these same platforms are also being used um, to further hateful ideologies, to further mis and disinformation, and that in fact, you know, the platform in this case, um, I don't want to say it's neutral because nothing is neutral, right, but the, the platform is an object, it's a tool, and the way people use it uh, matters, and so people can use it towards sort of progressive or liberatory uh, goals, and they can also use it in, in the reverse direction, for sure. I say I, we're, we're, we're really getting close to time, so I want to make sure I get um, uh, last few questions in. Um, although I just got a message that we can go past one. So if we can go past one, let's go past one. Um, uh, question, uh, a question that's identified as a question from the Middle East. What does research say about whether an individual, on an individual level, hashtag activism can dilute offline activism by giving the impression, sometimes false, that one is doing enough to fulfill their civic responsibility. I guess you could call this the slacktivism question. You know, do people think that's a hey, they 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 achieved something? So uh, I, I will go first on this and say the the research is mixed. There are some who have found uh, that yes, maybe it's there, there's a bit of a slacktivism thing. There are others who have found no. Um, I have always maintained and will still loudly maintain that it's uh, starting from the wrong prompt. Um, if you are using this in a good campaign, then the hashtag activism or the digital petition you're signing or whatever first online step you're taking is the first step in a broader campaign to mobilize for social change. Um, and that's, that's a useful set of tools to have. I'm glad that we have, have them. Um, if you're having people sign, like I was invited on my campus uh, last week, some people are mad at our university president. This is before COVID-19. Um, and there was a petition to the university president asking him to just resign. And I was like, I am not signing that petition because that is not a thing that our target is going to do. Um, that was like, that was a bad activist tactic. And I think we really need to look at these things in terms of the broader campaign context, because the answer is like, yeah, if people are taking one action and then never invited to do another thing, yes, the research suggests that maybe that will leave them feeling like, okay, I did enough. Um, but that means that you're running a terrible campaign. If you're saying, we're just gonna do one thing and then not ask people to do another thing. Because if you ask them to do the one thing and then you say to them, that wasn't enough, here's the next thing we need to do, then the nice thing is that you've, you've changed the narrative, you've also potentially built a list, and you can use that to mobilize for power. Erin? Yeah, I mean, I think that, sure, tweeting doesn't necessarily always change the world, but it also does. <laughs> I mean, Black Lives Matter and Me Too are just incredible examples of that that did change the world, and so I think that I don't know. I, I think that even if your network is five people um, and you tell a story with a hashtag and that and those five people continue to share that story and, you know, the hashtag grows, I, I think that is activism. Like, it's not slacktivism. You're, you're doing something. And also, I think that, you know, this is, folks have said too that the idea that armchair activism or slacktivism, it's also kind of ableist because there are people who can't go to a protest all the time or maybe their best option is online and so to discount online activism i think is just rude and wrong and is against the research so yeah i just concur with with what what these folks have already said there's actually a great study that came out a few years ago um that if i had access to the other people I could share um, called the critical periphery and the growth of social protests. And basically what these um, researchers argue is that the people who are going to, you know, show up 
uh, carrying a sign, you know, tie themselves to the front doors of the university president's house, uh, go to the women's march, um, block traffic. Those people are engaged and going to be engaged in that way, regardless of um, sort of online activism. And so what essentially the idea isn't that because online activism exists, suddenly people that were going to show up to something in real life or were going to sign a petition in real life say like, oh, well, I'm no longer going to that thing. Instead, it broadens the number of people who are aware of the issue. And so they sort of argue that there's this periphery of people who have maybe never participated in a protest, maybe would never feel safe or comfortable or be able to physically show up uh, to something who maybe would be afraid to sign a petition because of some kind of backlash against them, but can have, you know, an anonymous Twitter account, for example, and that those people sharing information is actually very good for the promulgation of sort of the demands and ideas that come out of the movement and that that sort of exists um, in and of itself as something useful um, and and there are actually sort of a smaller group of people that are both the people who show up to the protest and tweet about it, right? Um, and so that they, these sets of sort of people overlap and are, are, are all um, important. And also thank you to that person for tuning in from so far away. I love that. Great. I mean, and, and the, the question, of course, has a slightly different context in a world where there won't be much canvassing for a while and there won't be a lot of in-person protesting people probably won't be chaining themselves to things for, for the foreseeable future. Um, so it's interesting how, how different that, that it's an old question and it, 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 feels, it feels a little different. Um, let me uh, throw out a question from, uh, from Elena Soros in the political reform program, which is, can, can this kind of hashtag activism genuinely be, democ be democratizing and opening up organizing to people who otherwise wouldn't have a voice weren't involved in existing organizations, or is the commercialization of just the commercialization of it kind of drown that out? I mean, how much is this? How much is this really new? And how much can can it be? You know, whatever can it be democratizing? I guess is probably the summary of the question. I mean, I think yes. That's why I wrote a book mm. about it. <laughs> 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 Obviously, but there, yeah, there is I, a lot of noise. I mean, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of commercial stuff. There's yeah, a lot of misleading stuff. I mean, one question I've had in my, I mean, maybe to just further put the question a little further, like one thing I've been thinking about that at a number of points in this conversation is like, as a, as a person engaged, I'm continually trying to figure out who to trust and what to trust, you know? It's like, you know, I was thinking last night that I spent the first part of the Trump era trying to figure out which of the people who do elaborate Russia theories are reliable and which ones are crackpots. And it's a lot of work to do that. And it's a lot of work. And now I'm like, okay, who are the bullshit epidemiologists and who are the actual epidemiologists, you know? Um, a lot of work to do that. Or the, the, the Coney 2020 example was a good, you know, yes, like the first thing I heard about it was that it's this really dubious organizational mess. And so that's the, that I carried that skepticism with me but, uh, but in other cases, I don't actually know what's going on. So it's like, I, I, in a way, that's the, how, how, do, how, do we prov how do we ensure that kind of real activism, useful activism or whatever kind of cuts through the noise? Well, I mean, I think to use the current moment rather than, you know, a book example, which I could also use, um, the trending of the hashtag flatten the curve. Mm -hmm. um, which really, it wasn't, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> a public or government, you know, campaign to trend that hashtag. It was uh, doctors and nurses and physicians assistants and epidemiologists on Twitter explaining to people, sharing, you know, infographics, explaining what the concept of flattening the curve were that really led a lot of Americans to now be familiar. Now you hear people and see people say, in their Twitter posts or on their Facebook posts, you know, flatten the curve. And we all seem to understand what that means, even though that's like really a shorthand for something that's like pretty complex idea. And so I would say, yes, of course, you know, it's it doesn't mean that everything, and certainly it's not the case that everything should be trusted or as useful or can spread democratically. In fact, in many ways, that's not true for many things, but certainly for some things, um, we still see um, sort of ordinary people 
um, having influence, having power, and it benefiting uh, us as a whole to sort of listen to those to those stories and narratives. And one thing we found in the book is I think that social media users are more um, sophisticated than we sometimes give them credit for when we talk about them as a whole. Of course, we know dis and misinformation is a huge problem. We know there are a lot of people that believe things and consume things online that are not trustworthy and have bad information. But what you have to remember is there's also millions of other people who are consuming things online and are doing the work of sort of judging, mm, let me check this source, let me do this other thing. So do we have a problem with 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 whether um, information is reliable and whether ordinary people, you know, can be believed and all this stuff? Yes. Do we also have people that are able to sort out mis and disinformation and engage and tell honest stories and help us learn a difficult concept like flatten the curve? Also, yes. So I would just say that there's it's nuanced. Dave, I, I know you probably have to pop off soon, so yeah comment on this and then we can let you go and and we'll wrap up in a couple of minutes yeah um yeah so what i'd add is it it is nuanced and there's a role here for the platforms right now for the platforms and eventually for regulators if we ever go back to a time when we have government regulators who actually get to regulate things um like the, the pound the table moment that i always have when people ask me about social media and disinformation uh, in the 2020 election is to remind people that we don't have a functioning FEC. And if we don't have a federal election commission, then yeah, Facebook and Twitter and Google are just gonna have to make up the rules on their own because there's literally no one else to do it. Um, but th there's a role for the social media companies to not just disincentivize bad behavior, but notice where bad behavior is currently being incentivized. Like a lot of the, the, the fake news factories out of Macedonia that drew so much headlines, so many headlines in 2016, those were partially being run as, an, as a political influence operation, but they were partially being run because there was a lot of money to be made in setting up those fake news factories and, and spreading through Facebook and Twitter. And it was after the election that Facebook demonetized those, they set new rules to demonetize them. They could have and should have done it beforehand. You know, the, the, the whole question of like, who should we be trying, like what epidemiologist should we be trusting online? Um, it's nuanced because you're always gonna have some asshole who decides that it would be fun to lie online. But those assholes will be relatively rare if A, they are aware that they can lose their platform when they get caught, and B, they'll be rarer if there's no money in it. The, pl the way that we end up getting a ton of this stuff is when it's a, an effective business model to run a bunch of scams. And again, again, ideally we would have an FCC and an FEC that actively worked out these tough problems because I don't think that the platforms, I don't think a few companies should be the ones setting the rules of, of public discourse. But if we're not gonna have regulators, then I'm afraid we need uh, our, our digital monopolists to be benevolent monopolists. And for the, at least in the, in the short term, figure out where are their platforms creating monetary incentives, like financial incentives and reputational incentives that encourage terrible behavior, and then they should change the incentives. And then it'll still be difficult figuring out how to trust, who to trust. But I think it will be easier if the algorithms and the rules get adjusted so that you don't have as much of the stuff cropping up because there's money in it. Great, thanks. Although I, I mean, I do think as a user, it's the real challenge is not the bliars, it's the people who, you know, either don't know what they're act, are acting in good faith, but don't know what they're talking about. Or, I mean, even as I, if I try to understand a movement that's sort of, I'm not in, like if I want, if I want to get what Black Lives Matter or any of the is about, it's, it's, it's work. And I think we have to, uh, we have to respect how complex that can be. Yeah. And that'll still be work. I think there will be right now that's work layered on top of all the other stuff. And I think that work will always be there, but it'll be easier, I think, to take that on if we're not also cognitively taxing ourselves by trying to sort through all of the other junk that crops up because basically there's money in it. Great. Okay. And I'm going to need to run. So I know. Good luck. Thank we're you safe. very much for, uh, for joining us, Dave. Thank we really you, Dave. appreciate your contribution. Thank Thanks. Take care, everyone.
Yeah, I know we promised people we would finish at one, so I, I thanks to everyone for staying a few minutes over and for the great questions. Aaron, do you want to? I, I think that will be our last question, but but I'd love to hear Aaron's thoughts on this. I mean, I've actually raised a bunch of things here, so. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I, wherever I, you'd like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it makes me think about, you know, something as an organization, you know, when we're engaging with Twitter, you know, something that I should be really thoughtful about is, um, you know, retweeting people or making sure that people are engaging in good faith in our content. So, you know, if you're going through a hashtag campaign and you're like, okay, I'm going to lift up some folks that I don't know them, it's grassroots, whatever, you really do have to look at someone's profile because I have been in, been in situations where someone engages but they're tr actually trolling you and it's just not like very clear um, and I think that that's part of the due diligence of you know don't engage with people who have uh, fish catching pictures as their profile no shade to anyone who has that as their profile picture but uh, I think we all know it's a big troll account flags. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, yeah, it's interesting to engage with that as a platform and you have to be really careful about who you actually lift up. And, um, and I think to your point too, yeah, it's like we can't trust any one person too, right? You know, we have to check with the consensus and get multiple viewpoints and all those things. I think that's where the the, the links to organizations can actually be really helpful there. Like I was thinking, Sarah, when you were talking about the Planned Parenthood campaign, like that's an organization that comes in with, it enters the conversation with an enormous reservoir of trust. Right, right. Uh, kind of greater right. than any organization that exists. Yeah. Well, I mean, it has to use that carefully, of course. Yeah. Um, just one last thing on that, I think, because you just triggered something that's really important for me to say about the hashtag networks we study is offline and in-person real life trust matters a lot in these networks because and a lot of people don't realize this you know when twitter was first launched it was launched as a microblogging site and a lot of people from the blogosphere so a lot of feminist bloggers a lot of you know various bloggers moved from blogs onto twitter or kept and maintained both and so actually a lot of the networks the early sort of roots of the networks we study in the book the racial justice networks the feminist networks started with people who had been interacting for years in blogs and on their blogs. So they had maybe never met in real life, but they had already um, sort of acclimated to a culture of, I ask questions, you respond, there's good faith exchange here. And so that then later facilitates the trust that when somebody starts a hashtag, people, maybe if they've never even seen that person in real life, can feel like they've known that person for 10 years. They know that that person's a real person because, you know, they've followed their blog and have seen pictures of their kids. They know where they work. They, you know, whatever. So there is like a certain level of trust, I think, even on the individual level of how users choose to or not choose to engage with particular user, other users and hashtags. Fascinating. That's so great. All right. Well, I've gotten the time to wrap message, which usually takes a different form, but uh, <laughs> uh, let's, um, unless you want to, you want the last word, Aaron, otherwise we'll. No, I think, uh, yeah. All right. Well, great conversation. We appreciate, Thank you all um, so much. All, all, both of you and Dave for being part of this, as well as the audience and uh, uh, New America uh, team for helping to put this together. So, Hopefully this will be this will be the first of many that the uh, political reform program and uh, fellows program do. So thank you all very much.